So first of all, I'm very grateful to the organizers. Thanks a lot for having me here. And this is the topic of my talk. I will talk about some effective theories for heterogeneous layers. So first, I'm presenting some physical experiments. Some of them are quite old. Some of them are pretty, pretty recent. And then I will try to model these effectively uh, and then talk about energy minimizers. So basically, I'm talking about something which, is, which we've seen uh, already this morning in Giovanni's talk uh, on, on uh, heterogeneous structures which are grown epitactically. So if you enlarge this, so there are experiments by these authors, which are quite old right now, uh, by now, uh, which work in the following way. You have two materials, you grow on, on top of each other, but they are grown epitactically. So uh, this blue material has a smaller lattice constant than the yellow material, and they are grown on a substrate and also some sacrificial layer. And then if you etch away the sacrificial layer, the kind of film wants to reduce, and it starts to bend up, uh, like the experiment that you know from the classical bimetallic strip. And then some curvature arises, and in this way, people have been able to form nanotubes. So this is something which really works on a very small scale. So I'm showing some experimental pictures here, which are really like nanometer sized, where people have used this in order to produce some nano scrolls. They, they, they call by rolling up these thin structures. OK, so these are quite, by now, classical results. Here's a little bit uh, uh, a more recent application. OK, don't look at the precise material here. So there's some material which basically acts uh, in the same way. It forms uh, a bilayer. And after some treatment, uh, this um, pink part here wants to contract, and the blue part wants to, wants to expand. And this uh, leads to such configurations in order to, um, in, uh, to, to release energy. Now, the interesting point is that if you look at this experimental picture, so this is a reflecting surface, they show two different uh, kind of phenomena. So the first one is if you have quite small, so you have still rather thick films, but the, the lateral extensions are somehow small, or other, to, to put it differently, the internal misfit between these, uh, these layers is still rather small, then what you observe are these kind of parabolic or spherical caps. In contrast, if you have something which has uh, larger dimensions, which are much more extended, or if you have a much higher um, um, misfit in the material, then these things try to roll up. And there is a, an engineering application for this. So the engineering application is simply the following. So if you locally just look around the vicinity of one single point, the best thing that you can do is you would like to do these spherical caps. Yeah? And this is, in fact, then OK if, you, if the lateral dimensions are not too big. But then, if you, if you try to do this with paper, for example, and you want, to do, uh, uh, you want to do bending deformations, this is not possible for something which is largely extended. Because yeah, and at some point, you change the metric in the film, uh, and this would lead to, to enormous, enormously large energies. So if you try to do this on a very large probe, this will lead to geometric incompatibilities, and that would have much too high energy. And in some sense, it then would be better to introduce these kind of cylindrical deformations, because these are pretty nice root surfaces, and there are no geometric incompatibilities. Now, the, the aim of this talk is to understand this a bit better, and to try to, so to, to, to first uh, to, to explain this on mathematical grounds. Now, here's the work plan. So first of all, let's describe all this with functions in nonlinear elasticity. In nonlinear, because we have la large deflections, and these things undergo large motion, so we should, should have a nonlinear elasticity model. And then we would like to take the small h limit in order to see, to derive effective plate theories. Yeah? So something which is more which we can put our hands on, because minimizing these guys is rather difficult. But maybe we can say something about the reduced plate energies, which are OK to first order in H, basically. And then I would like to investigate those things for their minimal energy configurations. So that's the work plan. OK, so here's my one slide on, on nonlinear elasticity, just to make sure we, speak all the, we all speak the same language. I'm, I'm considering hyperelastic materials with a stored energy function W. This is the energy stored in a del the elastic deformation Y. And my typical assumption are that this is normalized if you have just a rigid motion, a rotation matrix, nothing happens. This is normalized to the energy minimum 0. And then this is the assumption of frame indifference. Post multiplying by rotation doesn't change energy, and there's some regularity. And basically, this assumption tells you it's a non degeneracy, right? So the, the set SO3 is a minimizer, but away from this, you, you really grow quadratically, and it's also. Uh, 
a growth assumption for, for, for very large values of f. Yeah? And then, well, this is nonlinear LST. However, if you have small strains, usually people do linearize, and this is also what we do in this talk. Now, if this is your energy, you can polar decompose your deformation matrix. You can neglect the R because of frame indifference. And then you can do Taylor expansion. So this is the Hessian and the zero and the first order Taylor expansion go away by this assumption. And you're left with uh, this matrix Q3, which, is less, which, which contains all the, the, the well-known elastic moduli of, the, of your material. And this is what, what really will enter everything that is going to come now. Okay, now let's look at thin films. What happens for thin films? And now thin films have this geometry, so there's a planar set S and a very small set H, which is still large compared to atomic distances. I would like to do this in order to, to stay in the continuum and not to discuss discrete models today. And these, these things are interesting, of course, because they show a much richer phenomenology, and uh, of course, in terms of applications, these uh, thin films are very important. Now, there's a very classical, um, classical um, goal in elasticity theory, you would like to identify um, effective theories, which basically are good to first order in H, and which describe the model effectively, but just in terms of a plate deformation. Not a 3D object, but just tracing the mid, the mid line of a plate, because this is going to be much easier in a 2D problem, and also the structure will be easier for these guys. And here are the classical examples, so let me just draw the following picture. So what can you do with the film? If your film looks like this, um, so this is, this is your age, then basically you could do um, a very large stretching here where you still have H here, but this is, very, this is very large. So this is finite energy per volume. The whole film has the volume H, so this will cost roughly energy H, and this is what is called um, a membrane deformation. Now you could also do something which is not so severe. You could try to bend it like this in such a way that the mid fiber is an isometry, so it's not stretched at all. And then, if you calculate what happens here, so then you can convince yourself that the strain, in fact, is of the order H. And then, if you plug this in here, yeah, so something of the order H here, you have a quadratic form, it's H squared, and then you also have a little volume H. So this will lead to something of order of energy, roughly scaling with h cubed. And then I would like to add a third picture here. Now you could also look at something which has small deflection only. So consider, consider you're, 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 you're welding steel or something. So no, not welding, but you're, you're, you're just deforming steel, where in fact you have deflections here which are themselves of order h. Then you can convince yourself the typical strain has order h squared. And if you plug this in the Taylor expansion, this gives an energy with scales like h to the fifth, yeah? And now, if you want to look at what's happening here, so these all lead to classical, classical plate theories. So this uh, guy here is described effectively by a membrane theory, and this uh, finite bending regime uh, corresponds to the classical Kirchhoff plate theory, and this deformations down here, they correspond to the classical von, von Karman um, thin film, uh, thin plate equations. Okay, now in fact, these theories have been derived rigorously. First work goes back to Ledret and Raoult already in the 90s, and then there are celebrated papers by Friesecke, James, and Müller, who derive basically everything from A alpha equals three down here, and they show that basically these functions arise as a gamma limit of nonlinear 3D elasticity. And if you don't know what gamma limit means, that's not so important here. It just means this is the, the right limiting functional. I can minimize this functional, and then I know that I'm arriving at the right deformations. Yeah? So in this sense, it's a rigorously justified um, um, uh, effective model in order to describe these objects. OK. Now, um, what do we need to do for multilayers, like these bilayers we were looking yeah, at? So for, for multilayers, what you have to do is you have to take account of this a dependence of the material properties on the, on the thickness parameter. 
And it's, it's crucial that you divide this by h in order to have significant ch changes along the, the, the small film direction. And also, we, we know that sometimes the equilibria, like the lattice constants, do not match, right? So if this w naught is something which is minimized at SO3, we have this um, misfit tensor here. It's a matrix which basically, basically tells you um, that in, in this, well, just consider this to be a constant, and then this uh, h to the beta tells you how strong the misfit in the model is. Yeah? So this is the strength of the misfit, the misfit tensor, I would like to call it. Now let's see what if, if we introduce this. So if the mid misfit scales like h to the beta, what is the energy? Now let's take the, the simplest. The simplest deformation is do nothing. Just put in the identity. If you put in the identity here, then this term vanishes. Now we do our Taylor approximation again, and we see this guy comes out with h to the two beta, and there's another h here. So the energy scales like h to the one plus two beta. Now if I, so that's very small. Now I would like to extract the leading order term. So I simply divide by this guy here. And then I do something which I always would like to do. It's, it's so inconvenient to have this H dependence here in the, in the domain. I simply do a change of variables, which buys me another um, power of H. And I'm left with this function, which I call I beta. Now, in, in terms of scaling, this is now what, was, what used to be alpha before, like these different values of alpha, the exponents. So now what do we expect? Now we expect, so what is the task? What do we have to do? We have to calculate the gamma limit now of these quantities here. And we expect that for beta equals 1, which corresponds to alpha equals 3, we're Kirchhoff, and then here we von Karman, and then there are some other theories which uh, inter or, or extrapolate in, uh, uh, these, these theories. And this mismatching equilibria will, as we will see, lead to some spontaneous strains in the limit model. Now, before I go on and show you what, what's the outcome of all this, let me mention that there's related work by a couple of authors who also um, look at materials with a pre-strain, which are independent of X3, for example, and also where the material properties are not really allowed to, to change their values. So um, this is some of the most uh, technical, difficult part, and uh, uh, that justifies somehow to look at this uh, uh, in more detail again. OK, so that's the setup, and now let's see what is the outcome of all this. Now, the first of all, that's a very old result. Let's do this for the Kirchhoff scaling. What happens for the Kirchhoff scaling? Suppose you have an energy, a sequence of plate deformations, and now I would like to, to see what happens asymptotically if H goes to zero, if they converge to a plate deformation. So first statement is a compactness theorem. If you have a sequence which is equibounded in energy, then these, the gradients, the blown up gradient here, because this comes from this uh, change of variables formula, converges to something which is uh, very nice. It's H1 again, and it's a rotation everywhere. And uh, more importantly, here is the gamma limit. So the gamma limit means this is now my 2D plate functional I should look like if I want to calculate minimizers. Yeah? And the plate function looks like something well known if you have seen this kind of uh, results before. It depends on the curvature tensor on the second fundamental form, which basically measures the two by two matrix, which measures the curvature of the plate. And it's an isometric uh, uh, immersion, which basically means the mid plane is mapped isometrically into three space. And uh, um, this quantity here is a polynomial of degree two, yeah? a positive polynomial non degenerate of degree two, which you can calculate. I will say in a minute how you calculate it. Okay. Now, let's look at this guy. How can you calculate it? Well, you can calculate, forget this, um, you can calculate it by the following. Now, you introduce for, the, for each t, for each layer, for each x3 value, you look at this formula here where you basically take, uh, minimize over strains in the x3 direction, which is taking care of the Poisson effect. And then you get something which Friesecke James Müller um, calculated for in the homogeneous case. Now, in our t-dependent case, basically, we get a new matrix depending, uh, sorry, a new polynomial depending on two matrices by this averaging formula. And basically, if you minimize everything which happens in the plane, then you get this quantity which was uh, of interest here, this quadratic polynomial. So this is a quadratic polynomial. And in fact, um, you can, you can uh, explicitly relate this to the moments, basically, of these uh, homogeneous forms, and then it gets this particularly nice form. Okay, but that's not important in the sequel. So that's the Kirchhoff case. Now, what is the von Karman case? The von Karman case is a bit more tricky because now 
the out-of-plane displacement scales like h, which means that the in-plane displacement scale like h squared. So I should, I should rather uh, rescale in order to have something of finite order, in order to capture the leading order effect, I rescale, and I scale this way, and here I look at the x3 um, averaged uh, vertical out-of-plane and in-plane displacements. And then the result is, I also have a gamma convergence result of these guys, and they converge to this, precisely to this quadratic function, to this quadratic polynomial in terms of the symmetrized gradient here, this tensor product, and the Hessian here. And again, I, this, this guy is somehow explicit. Um, they are finite on this, end, uh, on this grid, and in fact, what is the proof? The proof is completely straightforward, so there's nothing to do, in this case at least, if you know the results by Friesick, James Müller, if you know how to treat the, the, the misfit for the Kirchhoff plates, there's nothing more in this case. A little bit more interesting is to look in the other cases. So there was this linearized Kirchhoff, which is basically in between the finite bending, and so it's small deflection, but the out-of-plane deflection much larger than, than h. Yeah? So that's kind of in between. If you look at this, you have some different factors here to normalize, and you get another result, which now has the same quantity that we observed for the Kirchhoff functional, but here only like a linearized quadratic, uh, a linearized fundamental form goes in, namely the Hessian of um, the of the out-of-plane displacement, and there's a constraint, and the constraint says that the determinant must be zero uh, almost everywhere. And then u is basically uh, more or less given by in this term. Now here the proof is a little bit more tricky. You need some density results in this space, which is still doable by refer referring to, I mean, we can sort of adapt results of Pagsat and Hornung and then do some extra treatment for, for, for these isometric immersions in order to also get this uh, uh, dependence of smooth maps, uh, this density result here. Okay, so that's this. And last, there is another result. I can also do the completely linearized plate, so which is everything of small deflection, but now the deflection is even less than h. And I'm again having some uh, explicit result, and the proof here is again some addition, but you have to do some additional work, and in fact, there's now some new phenomenon coming up here. So the new phenomenon is somehow that something what you don't, don't, do not see in homogeneous plates, that now all of a sudden these terms couple which is not the, true, uh, not the case for homogeneous plates. And this requires some extra work as well. So good, so if you look at this, um, let's look at von Karman again. So there seems to be a strange situation. For every beta value of misfit beta between one and two, we get a linearized Kirchhoff energy, and we get a functional which is completely independent of beta. And we get another functional which is completely independent of beta for beta larger than two. Only for beta equal to, there's a functional which is different. So it seems to separate these two cases. So why is this? Let's look at this again. So the linearized Kirchhoff comes out for energies that scale much higher than h cubed, and the other one for energies much smaller than h cubed. Now, this is the, 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 the von Karman is in between. Now, the question is now, okay, let's assume it, con it, it is proportional, but now let's look at the leading order constant. Yeah? So let's try to divide this guy by this and see how large is the constant. And let's call this constant theta. And this gives sort of a fine, fine uh, structure to, 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 in the best case, interpolate between these two regimes. So let's make the following ansatz. Instead of just rescaling by h, and here, let's, this, let's rescale with another theta, which can vary from zero to infinity, and try to, to, to see what we get by this. Now, if we calculate the gamma limit, in fact, we do something, get something which is theta dependent, and indeed, this new functional precisely interpolates between linearized Kirchhoff and linearized von Karman. How is this the case? So that's a theta dependent, like a fine, fine parameter theta dependent uh, von Karman equation. So if you first calculate this guy here, then we're at this functional here, and then in the end, after this, send, send theta to infinity, you're at Kirch linearized Kirchhoff. And if you first send, calculate this gamma limit, but later let theta tend to zero, you're at linearized von Karman. So what we get is we get a one parameter family of uh, von Karman functionals parameterized by some theta between zero and infinity, which basically 
uh, interpolates between these theories and in fact uh, has uh, give precisely the right boundary values at theta equals zero and theta equals infinity. Okay, now let's look for minimizers since we wanted to look at minimizers. Now, the first, the two things are completely trivial. Let's look at a minimizer for such a guy here. Now, what you can do is, I can just take a piece, a, a, a point-wise minimizer by choosing some f, which is in the argument of this guy here, and then choose a cylinder which has a constant fundamental form. That's going to be a minimizer. And also the same is true here. I take a parabola, which is a degenerate parabola, because I have the determinant equals zero constraint here. Also, this guy has determinant equals zero, and I get a piece of a linearized cylinder. So these guys are minimizers, because they're pointwise minimizers of the integrand. And the same I can do for this uh, von Karman, linearized von Karman functions. Here I don't have the determinant constraint, so in this sense, I'm getting a real parabola. Forget about the u to leading order, so the out-of-plane displacement is what you're really after, because they are the leading order term. Yeah, the other one have smaller, have smaller contributions. Um, that's what I just said here. Now, what you can prove, and this requires a little bit of work, is that's not, that's in fact all the minimizers you can find. So there are no other minimizers, there are no minimizers that change, for example, the second fundamental form. Now, the challenging question would be to know what are the minimizers of this interpolating regime. I don't really know, I mean, we know something, so what we know is, um, of course, by gamma convergence, since these guys gamma converge for theta equal to zero and theta equal to one, if, if, I, if I let theta equal to infinity, they have to go to a minimizer of linearized Kirchhoff, which is a linearized cylinder. And if I converge to theta equals zero, they have to go to, to a non-degenerate par paraboloid. Yeah? But what happens in between? So let's look at a very special case. And the very special case is, so if you have, for, for in a very specific situation, our function reduces like this. So in this form, you precisely see why this really interpolates between these regimes. So if I put theta equal one, that's the classical von Karman. If I put theta equal zero, I get the classical linearized energy. If I put theta equals infinity, the, it, it, this, this translates to, into, into a constraint that this integrand has to, has, to, has to vanish everywhere, and that's linearized, precisely linearized Kirchhoff. Yeah? And now, what is the minimizers? Now, um, I, we do not know exactly, but we do have some numerical results. Um, and so what you can do is you can turn out your parameter theta and let it vary and see what happens, for example, to a circular plate. And this is what happens in the beginning. We have very nice circular shapes. And one point at one instance for, for a certain parameter regime of theta, we have a kind of sharp uh, transition to something which is more like a cylindrical, uh, not perfect here, but the, the larger theta gets, it gets more a cylindrical deformation. Now here's so just some convergence plots, which are maybe not so interesting. This is a bit more interesting, so basically this is a, a measure of the symmetry. I'm measuring the, 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 the principal axis, and the symmetry is quite nice here, and then there's some value where you really enter the cylindrical regime. Okay, with this I would like to finish, and thank you very much.